Happy New Year. I hope your 2020 is starting off with a bang. Thank you for listening to Author Stories through 2019 and all of the previous years. We had an amazing year last year and looking forward to doing bigger and better things this year. Before we get into the interview, we're going to thank a couple of sponsors who make the show possible. Please uh, give them a shout out and uh, look them up on Amazon and make sure that uh, you tell them that you appreciate their sponsorship of Author Stories. At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show. And we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it. And uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. And it doesn't cost you a single penny. Audibletrial.com slash Hank. And uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business. And she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love. And will help you to up your writing game. Pico School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters more in-depth courses will be added in 2020 make sure you don't miss a thing picoshouse.com slash newsletters writers i have an amazing tool to tell you about a revolutionary writing tool for planning stories campfire pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed complete your character design create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today. Visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Who wants to love a billionaire? Billionaires in New York, book one by Laura Burton. Julie does not love being the center of attention. She makes dresses for those who do. But when Emily, her matchmaking friend, begs for a favor, Julie can't say no. It was supposed to be just one date. She never expected to kiss the guy, then fall head over heels for him. When threats start rolling in, it becomes clear someone will do whatever it takes to break them apart. Now she's in too deep and walking away isn't an option. But with the paparazzi and drama involved, Julie cannot help but wonder, who wants to love a billionaire? Hollywood producer Harry Jackson is not an alpha male. He's goofy, sensitive, and will move mountains to make everyone happy. In fact, he requires a whole team of people to keep him from being robbed blind. Sometimes he even needs saving from his love of bad puns. But when an enemy threatens to jeopardize his chance at love, it's time to step up and fight. He's terrified, but the thought of losing Julie scares him more. Pick up Who Wants to Love a Billionaire? The Billionaires in New York, Book One by Laura Burton. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm super excited to have Lisa Gardner back on the show with me. Uh, If you go back to about episode 573, I think it was last year, uh, February, uh, Lisa joined me then and, uh, we had a fantastic time talking. She has a brand new book out that when you're hearing this is available everywhere and it's called when you see me. And as always, uh, what a fantastic read. Welcome back to the show, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much, Hank. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And, and you as well. Um, Lisa, you told us this great story last year about when you were about six years old 
you decided that you were going to write a book and you, you told <laughs> us about, you know, cutting the paper into these small sheets and stapling it together and, you know, your uh, Wizard of Oz influences. Um, do you, uh, when you sit down to write a new book, do you ever, you know, get that kind of giddy feeling of connecting with that original love when you were a kid? You know, writing a book is always, I mean, the beginning of a book is always my favorite phase because the idea is so fresh and new right. and there is that kind of giddy feeling of, oh, I mean, I wonder where this will take me. In the case of when you see me, because books come to me very incompletely, that's not really English, but <laughs> I just had this vision of a, of a girl um, who, because of an injury to her brain, can't read, can't write, can't speak. It's called speech aphasia. And she desperately needs help. But if you can't communicate at all, how do you go about doing that? And that just captivated me. And then I had to write this book so I could figure out the answer to that question. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you talked about uh, last time, you know, that you were a, a pretty bookish kid and loved Stephen King and, yeah. and things like that. But do you remember who uh, who the author was or or the first book or series that made you fall in love with mysteries and thrillers and uh, that kind of stoked the desire to write the kinds of books that you write now? Oh, I still remember where I was that I was pretty young when I read Silence of the Lambs. Oh. And that just blew my mind. Um, the escape sequence, Hannibal Lecter, that you could – do such things, think of such things. It was so incredibly clever. And I remember thinking, I want to be able to write like that someday. I still wouldn't say I'm Thomas Harris level, but it made it just, this is the coolest thing if you can pull it off. Yeah. There are lots of genres that we can trace back to, you know, hundreds, uh, if not thousands of years to these types of stories. Do you feel like that the psychological suspense uh, genre is is a fairly new creation? No, I think we've always been drawn to stories of one crime. Crime. Everyone talks about Cain and Abel in the Bible. It's one of our oldest stories. But I think some of the appeal for crime novels, and I mean, I think they've always, we've always had them, is there are predators that walk among us, and we want to understand them better, and we want to understand better the police officers, law enforcement, science that's also out there developing all the time to keep us safe. Um, it's heartening to know that you can stumble across skeletal remains and actually identify the person, learn so much about the person. Um, it, you know, it's like for all of the evil out there, there's all these, so these lines of defense. Right. Um, this book, When You See Me, is it the 11th book in the Detective D.D. Warren series? That's what people tell me. I'll be honest. I don't count. I don't even know how many books I've written. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I'm just I'm working on whatever I'm working on. I don't. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like a bad novelist. Thing. Oh no, <laughs> the, you know we would much we would much rather you be sitting down writing these than uh, you know doing inventory. <laughs> well, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, what is it about Dee Dee that uh, that keeps uh, bringing her to you, um, you know, you, you've written several great characters, but there's something about this character. Um, what what is it about her uh, that keeps, you know, bringing these fantastic stories? Dee Dee first captivated me with her just brash, bold style, and by being so unapologetically a workaholic. You know, eleven years ago, that was still a somewhat new role to see in, you know, in thrillers and, and female detectives, you know, she's not looking for the happily ever after the family life. She loves her job. She loves crimes. I mean, this is what she's living for. But I think what keeps bringing Dee Dee back is then, um, you know, it sounds weird because I'm the novelist and I suppose I'm supposed to know these things, but she's grown and changed so much. I mean, ways I never anticipated it and I've never actually had a plan for her. And I love this new dynamic of her working with Flora Dane, where Flora Dane is, you know, she's not a detective. She's a victim. She's self-appointed vigilante now and works for survivors, but she's not detective. But 
there's ways she can really aid Dee Dee's investigation. And there's ways that Dee Dee worries about Flora that to me is distinctly maternal and shows how much Dee Dee herself has grown and the new person she's becoming. And I think that's just captivating for readers. Right. And Kimberly Quincy uh, in this book as well. Yes. This, this real trifecta of, uh, uh, of, of female power is, is awesome in this book. So I, I joke I'm the non-series series writer. I have never intended to bring any of my characters back, and yet here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and part of it is, you know, now that I've written so many different books and had different characters in them, readers themselves, you know, they're posting questions. Well, what about Kimberly Quincy? And what about, do we see more Flora? Do we see more Dee Dee Warren? And it's like, well, why you pick? You know, there's these, I wanted to do something with a cold case and skeletal remains and that's the kind of thing where you end up with a task force right. um throw in rumors that jacob ness uh flora's kidnapper might have had something to do with this crime scene and you know now i have three of my favorite people all in one book <laughs> and, and, and how much fun <laughs> how much fun exactly exactly um <laughs> you mentioned at the very beginning that that you had this um this idea this sort of scenario that this person um needed to communicate and couldn't and um uh did, did did you say it was speech aphasia yeah you see it often in stroke victims or people who've had trauma to the brain it's damaged to just a particular area of the brain that not only impacts your ability to communicate but your ability to process communication so generally you can hear someone speak correctly but you can't make out written words um you cannot talk yourself. Um, and um, in most cases, that's not going to change. That level of brain damage is what it is. It's learning new ways. And that's one of the challenges I had with When You See Me was working with a speech pathologist and then working with forensic experts on interviewing victims and children. I mean, if you have someone you can't ask an open-ended question to, and you remember, they're always talking about legal justice, not to lead the witness, so to speak. Uh, how do you do that? And it was fascinating to talk to real world experts because they're like, this is our worst case scenario, but they're seeing it more and more with crimes involving autistic children, other people with communication impairment. It has come up and it is, you know, a huge challenge for law enforcement. What brought this condition uh, to your, uh, to your attention that that's, uh, or were you just thinking about, um, you know, disability someone was uh, was dealing with and then you realized this was a whole um, uh, kind of diagnosis or was this something that you had been researching for a while? I started more with just um, a situation. I think it's someone who is a writer and has always been able to communicate the idea of not being able to speak at all and then not be able to process writing. I mean, that's somewhat horrifying to me as, you know, as a communicator. So then I went to a speech pathologist and said, is there a realistic scenario where you would see this? And it turned out, well, yes, actually, I was by chance describing almost perfectly a real world uh, you know, case that's not even that unusual. I mean, it pops up more than you would think. Um, and cut was kind of off and running from there. But yeah, it was starting with the situation and then backtracking to come up with the parameters to make it work. I love how the the kernel of an idea, you know, someone who can't communicate then grows and grows and grows. Um, yeah. That, that part of, you know, the discovery of writing and figuring out what the story is, even before you start writing, um, do, do you have, uh, you know, over the, you know, hundreds of books that you've written, and I'm, I'm winking as I say that, um, the uh, – <laughs> I, over, you know, working out your process, have you come up with a, a good plan of the, the preparation for writing, the pre-writing, when you're starting to kind of gather the steam and take notes and figure out what what the problem is that your characters are going to solve? Um, yeah, so again, I, I'm glad that everyone thinks I have a plan here. <laughs> <laughs> so my process has changed quite a bit over the years. When I was first starting out, I needed a plot. I need the security of knowing what would happen next. But I felt over time, if I always knew what was happening next, so would the reader. 
and of course, I want to create books that are surprising and have great twists and turns. So over the years now, what I've developed is I come up with a situation and generally some kind of crime ripped from the headlines. When You See Me has a lot to do with a lot of the cold cases we're seeing now and how far we can get with identifying and learning the history of, you know, skeleton, skeletal remains. Then I interview experts. Okay, if you confronted this situation, someone who could not speak or, you know, a 15-year-old grave, uh, what would you do? How much could you learn? What are the techniques? But what actually will happen next or what's the mystery to or the solution to the riddle? That's something I have to write to find out. And since I don't know what's going to happen next anymore, um, the good news is we can all be surprised together when we get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of writers say um, that they're discovering the story as they go. Uh, and, and like you said, and, um, you know, I, as the reader, don't know what's going to happen next because you as the writer didn't know what was going to happen next. Yeah. But but do you have an idea of the ending from the beginning? Like, are you are you writing in the dark? but with a known destination or is the, the final twist and reveal is that as much of a, uh, of a mystery to you as it is to me? I generally don't know the ending of the book till I'm almost there. And there's times it's very stressful, let me tell you. <laughs> but it's kind of both the magic and the faith of the writing process that this will work out. It has always worked out. Somehow it will work out. And if not, Go hike some more till the right idea comes to you and then it does work out. So um, those last months before deadline, I log a a lot of miles on trails frantically. What is happening here? Who did do this? I need to know. (laughs) I love it. You know, the the argument against writing that way and and people that are detailed plotters say, well, if you don't know where you're going, uh, you know, you're going to waste a lot of time writing things that don't end up in the book because you're just trying things, seeing if they're, if they work. Um, My experience is that's not necessarily true. Um, uh, You know, most people that are discovery writers um, keep it on track pretty well. Uh, Are there things that you do to try out ideas before wasting a lot of time on them? Or um, is this just kind of part of your writing process now? Like how do you keep the train on the tracks? I think if you're going to be an out of the mist writer, as we call it, oh, I love that. you're going to have to accept some. Yeah, you're going to have to accept some going off the rails. Um, you're not always going to be on track. I would say, and this sounds hard to explain, but I get it faster when I've made the wrong turn. I forked right, and I should have forked left. There's almost a feeling you get, even though you don't know the destination. You know you've moved away. I don't know, you're just headed in the wrong direction and you autocorrect a lot faster. And, and the solution seems to go, come pretty pretty clearly, doesn't it? Yeah, I do have to go back to my novels. Once I know, oh, this is who did it, this is how it happened, I do think I you have to go back and, okay, well, now this information here is not so necessary, but there's some more red herrings, there's some more elements that need to be built up there. I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's the cleanest process in the world, but... Uh, readers seem to love the results. And I do think in thrillers these days, people want to be surprised and you don't yes. want to see the ending coming. And this is the only way I know how to get there. Well, so. well, <laughs> well and adding in those red herrings or clues, that's what the editing process is for, um, that you, you get to go back and say, oh, I could really beef this up here. I could really trick someone here. Um, and that just becomes part of the writing. Sure. And I have some great writing friends, amazing novelists. They write the book once and they're pretty much done and they consider it good. And I will tell you, I have the worst case of author envy. (laughs) I have never thought I was a very good writer, but I seem to be good at rewriting. So for me, at least that editing process is where a lot of the magic happens. But I wish sometimes I could get it right the first time. (laughs) (laughs) Don't we all? Don't we all? (laughs) Yes, exactly. The new book, When You See Me, um, we find ourselves in a very different setting in this book than than you normally bring us to. Um, You know, after we've kind of established what the the problem was that you had at the beginning of the book. Now, talk to us a little bit about the setting and how this unfolds. Um. So one of the things I wanted to do in When You See Me is explore that, you know, that 
small, secluded mountain town. I think when you live in small communities, you start to realize how much um, it can become itself like a family with all the dysfunction and secrets a family has. So I started with that, and then I spent some time in, I never pronounce it right, my apologies, Dahlonega, Georgia, which is up in the mountains off the Appalachian Trail. And it's such a beautiful area and rich with history and ghost stories and the gold rush that you start to see just the potential everywhere. And so I wanted to use that as location. And then the bonus to all of that was taking my Boston cop, Dee Dee Warren, and sticking her in the middle of the mountains, where I get to discover, along with my readers, that she really is a city slicker, and this is not her cup of tea at all. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the challenges um, of leaving um, you know, a setting and, and a place that you know so well uh, and that you can just kind of you know, pull off the top of your head? When you're writing about a new place and new people, um, new, you know, cultural, um, you know, things, um, are, are those challenges uh, as a writer to get right? And um, what do you do to kind of check yourself to make sure that your writing voice is true with a new setting? You know, for me, I, I saw the opportunity of it. But see, I'd love to travel. And just even if I'm never using it in the book, part of travel to me is trying to learn a place and a sense of culture and a feel for the location that you're at. So the opportunity to set a book outside Boston and in a totally different environment was actually very appealing to me. Not to mention, I live in a small town in New Hampshire and I love to hike. So um, a destination where I could do some hiking to learn more about it was also greatly appealing to me. I, I think you always worry as a writer, are, are you being authentic or are you creating a caricature? And I think the truth is there's always going to be some elements of both. But you want to get enough details right that it the location just triggers that sense of recognition in readers' mind. I know what we're talking about. I get this. Right. Um, we talked about bringing these three dynamic characters together uh, in this book. Do you, um, when you're kind of balancing who gets what uh, part of the story, uh, is, is that a challenge when you bring these uh, these three headstrong characters together? You know, it's funny. One of the reviewers talked about in TV, when you see me would be billed as like a crossover event. Because basically there's different characters from different books all together now. And I actually was somewhat aware of that writing it. It reminded me of like the ensemble crime drama from TV where, okay, it was more important to make sure everyone had a defined role and that you could recognize their different styles. From Kimberly to me, who's very laser focused, to Dee Dee, who's very kind of brash, take no prisoners, to Flora, who's the vigilante turned you know, who's very, very edgy and slightly homicidal at times <laughs> and the different ways they would push each other and the different ways they push against each other. And I end up in the end finding those dynamics just to be so much fun to write. Right. Oh, tell us about the character of Keith Edgar. Um, how does he come in and what does he bring to the table? So Keith was a lot of fun for me and a total surprise. I was, Drawn to, again, a real world thing we're seeing with these Sherlock clubs. Um, you know, we're definitely getting to an era of fascination with true crime, cold cases. And there are a lot of people who are armchair detectives and even retired um, professionals, you know, ex detectives that form these Sherlock societies to investigate some of these old crimes. So Keith originally was kind of just a fun character to explore, an everyday guy, computer analyst, obsessed with crime. And then he meets Flora, and and then it turns out Keith looks like Ted Bundy. And honestly, I never <laughs> saw any of it coming, but I really like him. <laughs> it's so much fun. And When You See Me has one of my favorite writing scenes I've ever written in 30 years, and I think readers will recognize it the minute they get to it. What do you make of the the true crime fascination um, that, that is just white hot right now. You know, we, we, we talked yeah. last time about why we like these kinds of novels and, you know, that we kind of get to live dangerously 
from the comfort of our reading yeah. chair and explore some of the darker, you know, side of life. But, you know, in the capable hands of Lisa Gardner that we, we know we're not going to actually experience this. But but now we, we've come to a, a point where, you know, podcasts and documentaries about real, uh, you know, unsolved crimes or maybe, you know, people that have been wrongly convicted and, and or, or, you know, the kind of the whole gamut. But we're obsessed with with the real world now. Um, what do you kind of what do you make of yeah. of of where we're going there? Well, given I not spend all my time listening to true crime podcasts, right. I think I'm a good person for this <laughs> I think there's a couple of things. I think one appeal of suspense of true crime, fiction crime. We love puzzles human nature is drawn to puzzles and how to solve them. So there's forever the cerebral appeal. And I think the really great true crime podcast, it's one of those things where the truth is stranger than fiction. Some of these twists and turns are just shocking. And to know that this is what really happened, this isn't a work of imagination, makes it that much more compelling. And I think, you know, we're all surrounded by crime now. I mean, it's, the major headlines it feels like every day. So to have some reassurance of, you know, a lot of these podcasts are cold cases, you know, that, you know, justice will always prevail, whether it's two weeks, two years, 20 years later, I think there's a little bit of comfort in that as well. <laughs> sure. Um, as a, as a crime novelist and a thriller writer, um, do you, are, are you aware of kind of the, the tides of reader taste changing and is there ever, you know, stress on your part about, uh, you know, doing one better from the last book? I think in the, the 30 years I've been involved in suspense, we've seen a lot of transitions. And it's interesting to me because I think in some ways we're also about to transition back. When I first started, it was, you know, Thomas Harris. It was serial killers du jour. Um, and especially my first few books I wrote, I was sent them back and explicitly told to make them more graphically violent because that was a sense that that's, you know, readers were reading for shock. Now, really, in the past 10 years, I would argue we're in the day and age of domestic suspense. It's not the stranger anyone's worried about. It's the person sleeping beside them, which I'm not sure what that says about us as a society. (laughs) But but it is more statistically probable. (laughs) (laughs) And I think we've become more, again, the psychology of crime and the criminology. And that's actually, for me, what I am more fascinated by. What is the nature of evil? Um, how well do you know the people you love? Those much more, you know, insidious questions are what drive me as a novelist. And and what's odd is we never <laughs> seem to truly answer those questions because there's always no, another way to tell that story and, you know, another angle to look at it from. And, you know, as, as a novelist, that's yeah. going to be a great feeling that, you know, this is, this is a, an, an inherent problem that maybe we never solve, but, um, but, you know, to that question, um, you know, what do you hope that a reader is left with when they finish one of your books? What I love about writing suspense novels is you get more of a sense of closure and you can also get more of the other side of the story. I think one of the appeals to Flora Dane to readers is she is a survivor. So this is like her story picks up when so many suspense novels end. I mean, The person who kidnapped her, justice has prevailed, so to speak. But she's still not living happily ever after. In books, we get more of that depth. And I think you want to leave readers with seeing we are all survivors and we are all stronger than we think. And, you know, there's every reason to believe we will prevail. Right. Well, I know that you are uh, on, you know, a a novel a year um, schedule and, you know, when you finish a book like this, that is such an epic read, uh, and you've, you've kind of assembled this dream team crossover, um, how do you follow up uh, for next year's book with that? What are you working on now? You know, there continues to be stuff in the real world that I think is perfect fodder for crime novels. So one of the new developments, and some of this is covered in these podcasts we were just talking about, is we're getting more and more amateur people making genuine contributions to cold cases and real-world crimes. Um, Everything from genealogists 
um, to just, again, an everyday person drawn to a case, something they read on the news and taking up the reins. And so that has drawn me to um, an everyday woman. And there's entire messaging boards for this now, who she goes from town to town trying to solve cold cases of missing minorities. Interesting. Interesting. I can't wait to see um, where you're going to go with that. Who Who's your, your primary protagonist? Well, so it's an all new person. Her name is Frankie. Um, oh, nice. Why she does what she does, um, she and I don't know yet. We're still working on that. <laughs> but it's based on, again, real world stories. This has kind of become her obsession. And she talks about, you know, the cases that the police can no longer solve, that the media never covered and the community never seemed to care enough about. That's when she gets involved. And I've read some really amazing cases, everything from pilots who donate their time for searches to search dog handlers who are retired but still show up, you know, to work, not just immediately missing people, but, you know, remains still haven't been found. We're still trying to find them two years later, things like that. And it was really interesting, but I think we're also back to heartening, um, you know, real world people donating their time, their energy and their passion to make a difference. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to see what you do with that. Uh, Lisa, um, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show today. When You See Me is available everywhere now in hardback, audiobook, Kindle edition, any way that you uh, read books. Lisa, if people want to connect with you and dig into your massive back catalog and all the fun stuff that you do, where can they connect with you online? Um, it, I recommend uh, lisagardner.com where you can, like you said, check out the backlist also while you're there. Enter the person of your choice to die in my next novel and the kill a friend so made my buddy sweet sticks. Very important for the person who has everything. And right. then across social media, you can find me at Lisa Gardner BKS. Excellent. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for coming back on the show. <laughs> thank you so much, Hank. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The Near Future Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. 
in the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? he murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub, 
The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked Ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.